just with some quick introductions. Um, and then if there's anyone waiting to join, they can do that while I'm chatting. Hello, you've heard my voice chatting at you this whole time. My name is Cassidy. I am a community librarian with the Edmonton Public Library out of the Strathcona branch. I'm very happy to see so many folks joining us this evening for energy talks. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. We are recording uh, this presentation this evening. However, it is just capturing um, the co-hosts. So those of us you see up on the screen right now, as well as the presentation slides. That said, there will be time for questions and your video may go up on the screen at that point. Um, we'll do some editing, but if you really don't want your video shown, you can choose not to go on video or just let us know before you start chatting. It makes it easy for us to edit it out if that's the case. Um, as well, if there's any resources or information that gets thrown in the chat, we will make sure to capture that and send it out. And then finally, uh, just make sure while the presentation is happening, keep yourself muted, makes it easy to hear what's going on for everyone. <laughs> um, and then finally, thank you so much for coming. This is one of many partnership speaker series that I'm so happy we've been able to move online this past year. Um, I'm always excited when people show up because I have a fear that one day no one will and you'll just have to talk to me all evening, which is not exactly the intent. If you're interested, I've linked a couple times the upcoming energy talks, but we have so many other events happening, uh, especially coming into spring break, which I know feels like something that shouldn't be happening in a pandemic world, but spring break is still happening in terms of kids being off school and uh, looking for things to do from home. So we're going to have lots of online things happening to try and provide some form of entertainment, education, somewhere along those lines. On that note, I'm going to pass it over to Valerie from Future Energy Systems to uh, just introduce a little bit about them and our speaker today. Hello, everyone. My name is Valerie Miller, and I'm the Outreach and Engagement Coordinator for Future Energy Systems. We would first like to start with saying that the University of Alberta acknowledges that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respects the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. And thank you so much for joining us for Energy Talks Online. Uh, Future Energy Systems was launched in 2016 with a $75 million grant from the Government of Canada's Canada First Research Excellence Fund to help Canada transition to a low net carbon energy economy. We focus on multidisciplinary research that develops the energy technologies of the near future, integrates them into today's infrastructure, and examines possible consequences for our society, economy, and environment. We also contribute to the development of solutions for challenges presented by the current energy system. There are over 100 research projects in future energy systems, over 700 graduate students, postdocs, highly qualified personnel, and over 140 researchers. Uh, and you will get to meet one of them tonight. Uh, we wish to uh, remind current and future viewers that the opinions expressed by the speaker are not necessarily those of the Edmonton Public Library, Future Energy Systems, and the University of Alberta. And our speaker tonight, I'm so excited to introduce. Uh, Stephanie Ibsen was actually meant to be our speaker last uh, March and uh, you know, the, the global pandemic happened and that event got canceled. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we had them back uh, this year. Uh, Stephanie uh, and I have been in school together for probably too many years to count. Uh, and Stephanie refers to themselves as the scientists that Edmonton built. They completed their undergraduate program at McEwen University before continuing at the University of Alberta for graduate school. So Stephanie is currently working on their PhD in land reclamation and remediation. And that is what we're here to learn about tonight. So I'm going to invite Stephanie to share their screen and take it away. Well, 
First off, um, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, it's not like you had anywhere else to be, <laughs> but um, I think it's great that people are joining in and hopefully we get to learn a little bit of something today. Um, so thank you, Valerie, for the introduction. Um, and I appreciate very much the land acknowledgement. Um, like with land acknowledgement, that is our attempt to work towards reconciliation. And just like with reclamation, reclamation is a very active science. So it has requires, you know, you can't just sit and wish that the ecosystem will repair itself. You know, we have to do action. So land acknowledgements are always great, but let's also keep in mind that, you know, to work towards true reconciliation, we do need action. So today um, we are going to be talking about the role of soil invertebrates and how they work in ecosystem recovery. Um, they are small, but they are mighty. And one thing you should know about me right off the bat is that I very much enjoy puns. So if that's not your cup of tea, it's going to be a long hour for you. Um, so I like to always start with the acknowledgements. Um, some people like to put it at the end, but there is a lot of people besides me and a lot of funding companies that have all come together so that we can make this amazing project happen. So we have Future Energy System, also the public library for you know, putting together this talk, and then all the other funding partners um, that just supported this research. It would not be possible without them. So here's where we want to talk. Here's where I want to start. When we think about environmental disturbances, um, I'm hoping you haven't been living under a rock and maybe you are paying attention to the news, but we are constantly seeing more and more environmental disturbances. And there are two types when we think about environmental disturbances. Uh, there can be natural disturbances. So if we look at the picture um, right here, that is, you know, the Fort McMurray fires that happened a couple years ago. Uh, so that's a great example of a natural disturbance. Uh, forest fires, floods, um, you know, Alberta's landlocked, but there are people that can experience, you know, typhoons, hurricanes. Um, Edmonton has had, you know, our own tornado, but we have our natural types of disturbances. And then the other type that we have is anthropogenic disturbances. And those are just things that are caused by human actions. So if you look, we have our natural disturbance like a fire, um, and then we can have human activities that disturb it like coal mining, um, urban sprawl. There's a ton of different human activities that really influence our earth. And if you think about it, and we start to think about, you know, atmospheric pollution, microplastics in the ocean, um, there really is not a single bit of pristine nature left because our human activities have really touched every inch or let's be honest, every centimeter because we are uh, using not the imperial system, but it's touched every centimeter of this planet. So we have influenced nature, we're affecting nature, we disturb nature on a daily basis. So that's what's happening in the world, but what kind of disturbances are happening in Alberta? Because let's be honest, we are, uh, according to us, uh, the center of the universe, right? So what kind of disturbances do we have? Well, we have farming. We have amazing soil here in Alberta, so we have amazing fertility, great crop production, but that is a type of disturbance. Um, if we look over in the middle, we've got forestry, uh, we've got you know pipelines, urban sprawl, coal mining, oil sands mining. We also have things like renewable energy. So when you have wind farms or solar panels, even though those are a different type of disturbance, they are still affecting all of these different areas. And even though, you know, urban sprawl or just human expansion, it may not feel like a big issue in Alberta because we have so much space. But if we look in other countries with limited space, you know, they're not sprawling so much. So they're trying to decrease their footprint. But if we look at all the different types of disturbances that we have here in Alberta, it's very clear that we're probably making some kind of impact on the environment. So, okay, well, what does that mean? We know that there's disturbances. Um, so just even looking a quick Google search of, you know, what's happening 
with our habitats, what's happening with this land, we start to see some of these news articles popping up. You know, we need to rescue nature. We have a biodiversity crisis. Um, you know, we have, we're losing habitat, we're losing wildlife all because of our human activities. And we know this has been happening and none of these headlines are new um, because again, this has been going on for years. We've been hearing about our biodiversity crisis. We've been hearing about habitat loss and extinction rates. We are now currently in the, like, an extinction rate itself, you know, losing tons of organisms every single day. So we know all this is happening. So, so what do we do to fix it? I, I'm a fixer. So how do we fix these problems? Well, this is where we come in. It's land reclamation. So, that is the whole thing that I've committed my life to. And it's one of the best ways I believe that we can really counteract a lot of these negative effects that happen from these human activities. And a lot of time when I say land reclamation, a lot of people just think about, you know, oh, it's associated with mining or it's associated with, you know, other resource extraction. But we also have reclamation that happens in cities. Uh, we have reclamation that happens, you know, all over the world. It's not always just associated with resource extraction. But land reclamation is just, it's the science and a process of taking an area that has been disturbed and then returning it back to what we like to call equivalent land capability. So you're taking something that's damaged and you're going to put it back to something that was may be similar, doesn't have to be the same, but it should at least function in the same capacity as to what was there before. So if we look at the images that we have here on the right, um, this is actually up in northern Alberta um, out at Fort McMurray. And on the left side of the picture, this is the before, you know, this is the makeover edition. And on the right side is what we can see after reclamation has come in. So, you know, mining, we just see a bunch of, well, not nice stuff, not nice stuff. And then once we get the reclamation, we have, you know, it's green again, we have a pit lake going on, and now it's an area that humans can use again. It's not an eyesore, all of that good thing. So that is just the importance of reclamation, land reclamation and the science behind it. This is how we will actually be able to combat some of these issues. Okay, so land reclamation. You know, it seems really easy, right? You just fix it. So there is a process as to how we like to do it. Um, so just to go over so you guys can all become professionals, there's a step-by-step. -step. So our first step is we like to look at, okay, what is the type of disturbance, right? So do we have things like coal mining where we're digging quite low and we're extracting surface resources? Or maybe we have something like, a pump, right? An oil pump and we have a lease site and maybe it's smaller, but we want to identify what type of disturbance we have. So let's just say maybe we figured out, okay, well, we've got a well site. So we've identified our disturbance. Then the next step is, okay, well, we have this area we want to fix. What should we turn it into? So if we look at the picture here on the left, right, we have our well site. Okay, well, what do we want to turn it into? So it's, in a remote location, probably not going to create a mall or, you know, a recreational area. So we always have to think about the surrounding area. Do we need to blend it in? Um, but we have to figure out our end land use. And most of the time, it's either in Alberta, we're going back to more agriculture or we're going to more forested. So once you figure out, okay, we're going to go back to the forest site, then we can move on to our next step. So our next step would be remediation. And that's just going to be if you have any type of spills. So we live in a world where mistakes happen. So you can get diesel spills, oil leaks. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard stories about gas, uh, pipeline spills. Um, so if there is any type of contamination on our sites, that has to be taken care of, not just for the safety of the humans, but also you know, for all the animals, all living things around. So sometimes what that requires is if you have contamination, you might have to remove it or you might have to treat it, but you definitely can't leave contamination like metals or hydrocarbons um, in your soil. So that's an important step not to overlook. And then once all of your contamination is gone, 
Then you get to build your soil. So the next step is the soil reclamation. So we're coming in, we're building our soil. That's, and then after that, we're going in, we're planting our vegetation. So that again, pulls back into our end land use. What do we want to see? So we pick out all of our different species and that's all good. We get it planted, we let them grow. And you know, a bunch of years pass. And as those years pass, we monitor because we wanna make sure that this disturbed ecosystem that we have now repaired continues to stay on the trajectory that will inevitably result in our end land use, which would be a forest. So we need to make sure that we're hitting all of our targets and that you know, if we had to do remediation, that there's no contamination. We want to make sure that all of our plants are growing, um, maybe that some of the wildlife is returning. So monitoring uh, happens at the end of the process, but it's very important because that's how we determine if we've been successful or not with our project. Okay, so we know we're disturbing things. We know that we can fix it because we can have our earth doctors come in and put everything back and monitor it. But is what we're doing actually fixing the environment? So this is where things get a little bit dicey because depending on who you talk to, you will get different answers. Um, but when we look a little bit about what's happening in the news, um, there's a lot of headlines that are coming out saying that maybe the reclamation that we're doing may not be giving us exactly what we are hoping for. We have a lot of new projects that are starting to happen. So again, if you were paying attention to the news, um, there's a lot of expansion happening in the Elk Valley coal mine, which is in a very um, sensitive ecological area. So there's a lot of people looking at the reclamation that we do now saying that, you know, if we're not being that successful, perhaps we shouldn't be expanding. Um, and then a lot of issues with the people that are supposed to be making sure that reclamation is done properly, um, if they're actually following up with companies and making sure that the reclamation is being done. So again, we get some mixed reviews that maybe we're not doing all that we can do. So when we look at it, are we doing enough? Um, and some people say yes, uh, and spoiler, I don't think we are. <laughs> so are we doing enough? So as I started to really think about that, are we doing enough? Um, I looked at all the different steps in reclamation and reclamation monitoring, that final step, that's how we ensure if we're being successful or not. So I looked at how do we measure success right now? So in Alberta, after we've gone through the whole process, we put our soil back, we've planted, it's green, it's beautiful. Um, then you go in and all you have to measure are some soil and vegetation characteristics. So you go in and in the top picture, that's me looking oh so great in a hard hat. Um, but for vegetation assessments, you know, you set a quadrat down, you look at all the different species, all of those fun things. You take some soil samples, and then as long as those match what's happening and meeting your thresholds, you're fine. Um, and when we start to look at how ecosystems work, how they function, we know that just measuring soil and vegetation does not give us an entire picture. It's more of a two-dimensional approach because it doesn't focus on biodiversity. It doesn't focus on measuring how an ecosystem works and how it functions. So when we look at the whole goal of reclamation is that, you know, we want to build sustainable and resilient ecosystems, hopefully high in biodiversity. But when we look at the goal for reclamation and how we're monitoring and measuring that, those two are not adding up. So the more that we have a global pressure to create, you know, sustainable, resilient, long-term ecosystems, people are starting to worry and there's starting to be some concern that maybe the indicators that we are using right now to monitor these ecosystems, they might not be giving us a complete picture. Okay, so if they're not giving us a complete picture, you know, when we monitor, we do our veg, which we have on the left, we take a soil core and then hopefully that lets us know that we're gonna end up 
you know, right after that equal sign, we're going to get a healthy ecosystem. So that's what we're measuring right now. So here's what I'm suggesting. Now, bear with me. Ah? I think we need to add an indicator instead of just veg and soil. And I think you guys probably know what it is just from the title, <laughs> but I want to add another indicator. I want to add soil invertebrates. Oh, that feels good to say. So when I say soil invertebrates, I mean things like beetles. I mean things like mites. Um, so things like insects. Mites are um, in the same order as like spiders. So they have eight legs. Um, and then other things like hexapods. Um, so a lot of people think that anything that's crawling is an insect, and that is your first mistake. Uh, insects have six legs, um, and they have to have a certain body plan. And then hexapods, they also have six legs, but they have a different body plan, so it's different. And then we have our mites and our spiders that have eight legs. So not everything is a bug, not everything is an insect. So soil invertebrates, okay. Cool, you know a little bit about them. So they're part of the soil biological community. So when we look here over at this nice graphic, we can see that there's, you know, two major components to the soil biological community. You know, we have the microbes, so all the little bacteria, all the fungi, and then we have the soil fauna, which I am including in soil invertebrates. And when we look at this like cool circle and all these arrows, all this is showing you is that they are involved in so many different things when it comes to the soil. So they help with soil modification. So that helps with, you know, water entering the soil. It helps with the soil having, you know, really good nutritious material available for plants and other animals. Um, they help fertilize the soil, not just with their movement, um, but also um, with any of the fecal matter that they cut out or that they let out. Um, so all of the things that they're doing, they are the driving force behind soil and what makes soil fertile, what makes a good soil. So they're, just, they're vital to the quality of soil. Um, and then because of that, they have a direct influence on the ecosystem's health um, there's research that shows they have a direct link to the biodiversity and the stability of all of these different ecosystems. And some really cool research actually out of China um, and India saw that when you have higher abundances and higher diversity of the soil biota, it actually just accelerates the recovery time much, much quicker of an ecosystem. So they're helping because, you know, they're decomposing all this dead organic matter, they're making really fertile soils. And that is great because soil is the foundation of life. So if you have a really good starting material, you're gonna able to grow all the vegetation and then everything else comes back after that. So they're incredibly, incredibly important. So soil invertebrates. Oof. So they're kind of in a bunch of different categories. Oh, there is a test at the end of this. I'm just kidding. Um, so we have our microfauna. So those would be, again, like the bacteria, the really small ones. And then if you go to like the macrofauna, a lot of that is going to be things like worms or millipedes, centipedes. Um, those are the larger sizes, those you can easily see, you know, with your naked eye, microfauna, not so much. And then mesofauna, it just, it depends. Um, so you can see in the mesofauna, we have insecta, so all of our different insects. Um, we have some of our mites, but most of our soil invertebrates are going to be falling into the mesofauna category. So we know that there's a bunch of them. We know that they contribute really, really well to the soil quality and they're a vital part of our ecosystem. But just because they're, you know, fun to look at doesn't mean they're actually a good indicator. So when we're measuring something, what makes a good indicator? So we need something that can react quickly. We need 
exactly what they used to do in those old coal mines. And you used to take the canary into the coal mine, right? And as long as they were in the coal mine and the canary was chirping, they knew it was fine. They knew that their oxygen levels were good. And as soon as that bird croaked or you know stopped chirping or laid down, they knew it was that early detection, right? They knew that something was wrong and they needed to get out. So that's what makes a good indicator. If something is wrong with our ecosystem, we want to know as soon as possible so that we can make those corrections and get it back on track, right? So what's great about soil invertebrates as indicators is just like me, they are super sensitive. <laughs> so they are sensitive to a bunch of different things, especially management practices. So if you, you know, come into their home and maybe you are spraying a fertilizer or a pesticide or an herbicide, they're really sensitive to that. So their population numbers um, will decrease really, really quickly. Um, and it happens much faster than soil. It happens much faster than plants. And it happens much faster than birds, amphibians, um, and other you know, vertebrate organis organisms. They respond very, very quickly. So what makes them great is that they're sensitive. Uh, what also makes them great is they have very, very short life cycles. So, you know, in the span of a year, you can maybe go through, you know, a couple generations, depending on the type of invertebrate that you have. And then if you think about, you know, vertebrates, you know, like caribou, their offspring, they're not having, you know, as many offspring. So we're getting really quick turnover times, uh, really short lifespans. So we see the changes much, much quicker. And another thing that's great, because they are so small and a lot of them have a limited dispersal capability. So when you're in the soil, if you don't have enough moisture or somebody sprays a pesticide and you don't like it, you can't really leave. So they're just stuck there. So they will either, you know, overcome that disturbance or they will die. So we will see the changes in their diversity, we will see the changes in their community composition as the ecosystem changes, and we will see it much sooner. So they can be used as ecological indicators. They are one of the better ecological indicators out there, and they act as a really great warning system. Okay, so if we know that they're so great, why isn't it happening? So it's not happening because if you want to work with invertebrates right now, you have to be Liam Neeson from Taken. You have to have a very specific set of skills. And that specific set of skills is identifying all these different invertebrates and figuring out either what species or what family or what groups they all belong to. And that takes a lot of time. Uh, it takes taxonomic expertise, it takes money. Um, and right now, it's not required. All you have to do right now is measure your soil and your vegetation. And people don't really want to have to measure more because that's all we have to do. But again, is what we're doing enough? Is measuring soil and vegetation enough? So I don't think it is. So I started to ask myself questions. I said, Stephanie, let's ponder this together. And I really wanted to know, if we're using soil, vegetation, and invertebrates, and I look at all of them equally, what is the most effective indicator? Is it soil? Maybe. Is it veg? Maybe. But no one's ever really looked at other parameters, so we don't know. Um, so I want to know which one actually is the best. Um, and are the current criteria that we're using, are they actually enough? And then if I, maybe they are enough, maybe they not, but if we're going to add invertebrates, which ones should we focus on? There's just, there is a multitude of them and which one do we pick? So those were the questions I started asking myself um, actually years ago. And then I went to my supervisor and I said, listen, I think we should answer these questions. And she said, yes. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> so when we look at, no, I think I wanna pause and see if there's any questions just because now we're getting into like the actual like meat and potatoes. Uh, so we had one question submitted in the chat. Uh, what matrices and indices do you usually use? But I think you're probably going to talk about that. 
uh, as we go into uh, your research. Uh, another question was, what effect do disturbances have on the soil biological community? Yeah, that's a great question. So it will entirely depend on the type of disturbance. So, um, you know, if you're putting in a well pad, you're not actually digging into the soil, you're more compacting it. And then if you do something, you know, like coal mining, you're actually digging out the soil. So, and then stockpiling it, but safe to say a lot of the disturbances, anytime you're kind of digging the soil, you're completely altering the habitat. So some invertebrate groups like disturbances um, and they will capitalize and their numbers will soar um, and then some won't. So it will entirely depend on the disturbance um, and the different types of invert groups that you have there. But yeah, good question. Impossible to answer. <laughs> Impossible. Uh, similar to how some invasive plant species really like disturbances and they'll make your entire site green, but it doesn't mean that your site's actually healthy. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so why do we currently use soil and vegetation as the kind of main monitoring tools? Why was it decided X years ago that this is what we're going to do? It does make sense um, to measure that and it's good enough. Um, so they're picked because they are easy to do. A lot of the monitoring that we do, we want it to be able to complete it in the field. So, you know, you can go in, look, fill out a couple of forms. So a lot of it, it is done because it does make ecological sense, um, but it was picked honestly because they are the easy parameters to measure. And even the ones that we currently monitor are, are some of the easier parameters that we can do in the field that don't require extensive lab testing. So it's part ecological science, part convenience and uh, economic parts of it, you know, the cost associated with it. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find that perfect balance of, does it give us the information without requiring special skills or so much money? Yeah, and right now we're all thinking that just measuring soil and veg is enough. Um, but again, it doesn't tell us enough about an ecosystem, enough for me to feel confident that these ecosystems are going to be successful, you know, 30, 40, 50 years down the road. Absolutely. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I can pop them in the chat. I have one more. Uh, how different is monitoring between uh, these natural disturbances that you mentioned and these more anthropogenic disturbances. Does the monitoring differ in between those two? Yeah, so with more anthropogenic disturbances, there's a legal requirement. So in Alberta, um, any type of, you know, mining or any type of disturbance by industry specifically they are legally required to reclaim. And because of that, there is a legal requirement for monitoring and they have to reach certain thresholds and then they get a reclamation certificate saying that they did a good job. So with anthropogenic disturbances, um, there's a lot more um, yeah, legislation around it. You're, you have to. No choice, you're doing it. Okay. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have so far. Uh, keep putting them in the chat box uh, so that we can answer them at the end. Okay, so we're gonna keep foraging ahead. Um, if you have questions, yeah, we'll still get to them. So again, I wanted, yeah, the whole aspect is what we're doing right now might be enough. But again, if we start to think about how our earth has been changing, how we have, you know, more occurrences and higher severity of natural events. You know, we're having more droughts, we're having extreme weather occurrences. That is happening because of climate change. Um, it does not matter if the United Conservative Party decides to acknowledge it or not, climate change is happening. And if we are going to move into the future, and especially in Alberta, we have very large areas of land that are disturbed that we think we can reclaim and that will be successful. But again, 
we need to know and we need to be confident that these ecosystems will have the same resiliency that natural ecosystems do. And, and the resiliency is that ability for them to bounce back after these disturbances. And knowing that with climate change and you know a couple hundred years down the road that these extreme climactic events are gonna happen more frequently, we need to do everything we can to make sure that these large disturbed areas are set up for success. So it's a really difficult question to kind of tackle and answer, but I decided to try to do it. So I got lucky in that my research location was really close. So we went out to the Genesee coal mine. So that's just pretty close to Edmonton out by Wapham and Lake. Um, and the Genesee coal mine, it has you know two active pits um, it harvests that coal and then it actually um, gets fed directly into the generating station over at Genesee and then that supplies electrical power to Alberta. And before we had, oh sorry, I got a hiccup. Before we had coal mining happening in this area, a lot of it was and still is agriculture. And then similar to kind of like the prairies in Alberta, you get the agriculture and then fragmented in between, you might get a little bit of like an aspen forest, maybe some peatlands. Um, but yeah, the research very close to home, which was great because I get to come home every day after the field. Um, so out at Genesee, um, there's different reclamation practices. Companies have their own best management practices. So companies determine, you know, how are we gonna remediate? How are we going to build our soil? What vegetation will we use? So out at the Genesee coal mine, um, they have pretty standard reclamation practices. So before they even go in to mine the coal, you know, they'll come in and they'll clear the vegetation. Any um, timber that can be sold gets sold. Um, anything left, you know, usually gets mulched or it gets, you know, left as a coarse woody material. Um, so once the veg is cleared, then they actually strip the soil back. Uh, the soil gets put in a pile and it just waits until you come to reclaim. So in the reclaim, we have, you know, our big pit that was from our coal mining and you take the soil that was stacked and then you put it back in. We build our soil and you kind of recontour the area to make sure it fits in. Um, and there's a lot of machinery that gets used to kind of avoid compaction. Um, and then at Genesee, they have a topsoil placement. So after they kind of put all of the subsoil, which is like the less desirable material, they like to take the really nice fertile soil, you know, the top couple centimeters and put that right on top. So it's a pretty standard practice. They have a nice, richer soil in the top 20 centimeters, and then they, they will put an amendment. So an amendment is just something they'll add it to, you know, really bump up the soil. So they can add wood chips, uh, they can add, you know, coarse woody material, which is honestly, it's a log. <laughs> it's logs, um, or straw sometimes as well. And all of these amendments, again, will help make the soil very fertile, it can help it hold water, um, and they're really just meant as giving the soil a jump start because there's no plants or anything around to contribute, you know, dead leaves, so we kind of try to put something in there, in there to give that soil a nice jump start. So if we're looking, and this is just important because we're, I just need you guys to see it. <laughs> so if we're looking down from an aerial view, we have the coal company, oh, Westmoreland Coal Company over here. That's the generating station. We have a highway running through Highway 770. Down below, we have the active mines. So these are actively getting the coal taken out. We have a cooling pond and my sites. So I picked two reclamation sites and the first one is that square and then the second one is that nice rectangle and then I got lucky I found these two reclamation sites and then right in the middle between them is a forest. It's a little forested track that has not been disturbed um, and it and then we have the two reclamation sites on it. So that is a perfect opportunity because now I can look at these two forested reclamation sites and how they're changing and I can compare them to the forest in the middle. 
as my reference site. So I wanted to know, right, if, if what we're measuring is enough. So of course I had to go in and I had to look at all of the different plant species. Um, so when you're going in and you're measuring your plants, you use a quadrat, it's literally a big square and I throw it into my plot and then I sit down and you look at all the different species and how much do they cover. So, you know, if there's a bunch of clover and I look down, what percentage of that square is taken up by clover? Um, and then you also assess the health. So if you look at the picture here, we have some bracted honeysuckle and on the leaves, I can see, you know, a little bit of disease. You look for other things and then I can quantify the health. I can kind of score it and see how healthy are these plants. And then the other thing that we're monitoring is we wanted to look at some of these chemical and physical properties of the soil. And that was an easy one because all I had to do was use my auger, I would take my sample, and then those got sent off to the lab. Um, so we could look at a variety of different chemical properties, and then you can look at physical properties as well. So what is the size of all the different particles in the soil? Um, what kind of soil classification is it? There's a bunch of other physical properties we can look at. And then the whole point of it was to look at the invertebrates. So we wanted to sample what's happening above ground and then below ground. And we used two different methods to try to capture all of the soil invertebrates. So the first method that we used is called pitfall trapping. And this one's fun because anyone can do it. Um, you just take a deli container, um, you make a little hole and you make sure it's flush. So if you look at the first picture, we've got our hole the container goes in and then you take two skewers and a nice styrofoam plate and we put a roof on it and that roof you know it keeps out the rain it keeps out the pesky mice and voles that like to try to come in um, but it still allows for all of the little invertebrates walking on the surface and then as they walk they fall in um, and if you wanted to do this at home in your backyard you could uh, just to see what kind of diversity or what kind of bugs you got crawling around. Um, we left our traps out for a full week. So that's why you see a liquid in it. That's actually a kill fluid. So as they walk in, they fall, the kill fluid. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we wait for seven days and then I come pick it up and I have all of my different inverts. So we can see a bunch of beetles, a couple spiders, um, and that's how we collect them that way. So you can do that in your backyard, just don't use the kill fluid. Um, and then if you're gonna do that, just make sure you're checking your traps at least um, every day, just to make sure that nothing's falling in and you know suffering or something like that. So easy to do in the backyard. Um, and that again, that was to cover all of the creepy crawlers on the surface. But then we wanted to know what about in the soil, right? Um, so we took soil cores and we took litter samples um, and we kept those, brought them back to the Alberta Royal Alberta Museum to extract them. So you take all of your samples and the invertebrates are still alive in your samples um, and you put them on the Tallgren funnel extraction. So if you look at the middle picture here, it's a funnel with some chicken wire and I put all my samples in some cheesecloth um, and then I attach a container on the bottom and I flick on the lights and then I leave. Um, and what happens is it creates this temperature gradient, this moisture gradient, and it just starts to heat up. And then all the invertebrates are like, ooh, let's get out of here. So they start to move down and then eventually they fall through uh, down the funnel and then they fall into ethanol where they are preserved. And then I can come by and look at all of them. So that's what we did. And now we want to look at the results, right? Like where are the meat and potatoes? So <laughs> what's difficult with this project is there are so many results and it's difficult to pick what I want to show you and what I want to learn and teach you today. But at first results, we look at, these are our vegetation results. So we have our forested site here on the left-hand side, and then we have our two reclamation sites. And we have our vegetation health is our first number. And vegetation health was scored from one to five, one being perfect, no issues, five being like, whoo, <laughs> you're dead. So when we look at this at first glance, we can see that in 2017, 2018, 2019, 
like the foresight in 2017, because it's, you know, the 1.34 much larger, well, not that much, but if we're looking at these numbers, it says right now that in 2017, the forest actually had the lowest vegetation health. It had the lowest vegetation health again in 2018. Um, and in 2019, they're all kind of the same. So that's interesting, right? You would expect maybe the forest to be better. And another interesting thing is when we look at the cover, so the whole cover, you know, if I look down at my square, what percentage of my square is now covered in vegetation? And again, really interesting that our forest is lower. So if we're looking at this little table right off the bat, you could look at it and you could say, oh, well, the reclamation sites aren't doing that bad. They've got really good cover. They've got relatively good vegetation health. So what's the problem, right? Oh, I will tell you what the problem is. The problem is, is when we start to look at the whole cover and what percentage of the vegetation is made up of different components, if we look at our two pie charts here for our vegetation and our reclamation sites, we can see that grass in blue makes up a really large proportion of it. Um, and then if we look at the forest down below, it has a really high cover of shrubs. Um, it has a higher tree coverage, much less weeds. Weeds is like the light blue. There's barely any weeds in the forest. And then when we look up at the vegetation here, the composition much, much, much different. And if we are working towards a forest reclamation, and that's what both of these sites are working towards, are we actually seeing that? Well, not really with the vegetation. We're seeing way too many weeds, too many forbs, and at this point, too many weed species compared to our forest. Interesting. Okay, so what about the soil? So there's numerous ways that we can assess a soil. Like I said, we can send it off to the lab, but there is some really good visual indicators that we can use. So these are just two pictures and that whole adage of a picture's worth a thousand words, it really is. So on the left-hand side, we see this forest soil um, and visually, you know, when we, when we see a darker soil, that usually means that it has a high amount of organic matter. So it's a really deep, rich soil. It has a lot of dead vegetation and that's what's made it so dark. Um, I can also see just from it that, you know, it doesn't look like it's smooshed together. Um, I also touched it, but you can feel the texture of it. Um, and yeah, you can make some assumptions about, you know, minerals present or the amount of organic matter um, just by looking at the soil cores. And then when you look on the right hand side, um, you can kind of tell it's it's almost like squished together. We don't have, you know, the the nice color that we do. Um, I can tell just, and because I've touched it, um, it is very high amounts of clay, so it's very densely packed. So just looking at the soils, we can immediately tell that there's a difference. And then there's other chemical things we could look at. So a good measure could be the amount of carbon. So again, if you think about dead vegetation and the way it dies and then goes back into the soil, um, that's a really good measure about fertility. So when we look at the soil that we measured just to see, okay, are there differences? There very clearly are. We can see in our reclamation sites that the total carbon in our soils um, just isn't where it should be compared to the forest. And again, that makes sense. It doesn't have, you know, the same cover, doesn't have the same veg composition, but that's something that we would like to see. We would like to see much higher amounts of carbon in our soils, and we're not seeing that so far in the reclamation sites as compared to our forest. Another really good measure that you can do for our soils is looking at the total amount of nitrogen. Um, so our forest soils generally are very nitrogen limited, so it's one of those hard to come by minerals. Um, so we know that our forest is going to be low regardless. Um, but again, when we compare our two reclamation sites um, and looking at the total amount of nitrogen that they have, again, it's just not where we would like to see it, but the difference is not that bad because if you look, and these are, I should have explained, they're box plots. so. <laughs> The middle line is showing you the average, 
And then the whiskers that kind of extend up, those lines that extend up, they show us the range of the data. So if you see a lot of overlap uh, between the lines, it probably means that there's not a huge difference between them. So even though you know the average total nitrogen for all of our sites is different, there is a lot of overlap. So the differences are not as significant as we would like. But now we're gonna get into what I actually care about. So when remember, remember, I can't talk. Remember when we took all of those pitfall traps? So we looked at all of them together. So we counted every single invertebrate that fell into that trap, combined those together to figure out our total abundance for each month. And this is what we came up with. So if you can see, so our forest site, again, that's an undisturbed site, that's in red. And then we have green and blue as our two reclamation sites. And we can see actually surprisingly, you know, in May, not that many. And again, the black line is the average, but we can see in May, there was, you know, some sites that had actually quite a lot of abundance. June, I don't know, we're kind of the same, but there is differences. We're seeing actually that the reclamation sites in some of these months actually have just way more invertebrates in the individual samples than the forested site does. So again, at first glance, that makes us start to think, hmm, well, why do they have more? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? So some of the groups that we captured when we looked at our pitfall traps, um, we had annelids. So annelids are worms and we have um, hemipterans. So hemipterans are what we call true bugs. So you can see them on the right-hand side and you know it's a hemipteran because if you look right here, it has a triangle and those are only found in hemipterans. So those are true bugs. So we found lots of hemipterans. Uh, we found a variety of spiders, um, <laughs> which I know most people hate. Um, so we found, yeah, like ground dwelling spiders, web weaving spiders. Uh, we also found uh, what a lot of people just call daddy long legs. So a lot of those in our reclamation sites, uh, we found a variety of beetles. So this right here is a fungus boring beetle, I believe. So it has the nice orange, they're very cute. And they have little clubs at their antenna that you can see. Um, we also found columbolins, um, different types of flies. So we found a whole swath of different insects uh, or invertebrates, sorry. <laughs> And now we wanted to see, okay, well, how do they differ between our forested site and our reclamation site? Because that's what we care about. We want to see where are the differences. So are there certain species or certain groups that are showing up when they shouldn't be, or maybe they're not there and they should be? So what is happening? What is the differences between these sites? So if you look in our forest site and we can see how these populations fluctuate from month to month, we see that the three big guys that account for and have the biggest abundance in our forested site are our dipterans. So those are flies, anything with two wings. Um, we also see a lot of spiders and we also see a lot of beetles. And then interestingly with these, a lot of these populations are peaking right around July. So that's really good information for us to have because if at the end of this, we decide that spiders you know, are the best indicator, I need to be able to tell people when they can sample. So I need to know at what month you know, do these populations peak? When are they not gonna be available? So you know, I wouldn't recommend sampling you know, in October or September because we see the populations have a rapid decrease. So our forest, interesting, it's, dominated mainly by beetles, spiders, and flies. And then when we go to our reclamation site, our first reclamation site, again, has a lot of spiders, has some beetles, and then a lot of ants. So the brown line that we're seeing here that we didn't see, because ants are way down here in our forested site, we're seeing, oh yeah, there's a lot of a lot of ants in our reclamation site and much less flies, which is the blue line. 
And another interesting thing is if you look at the forest site before, it almost looks like there is somewhat of a pattern. You know, we have May, a little bit of an increase, big increase. So at least it looks like these populations are kind of following somewhat of a similar pattern. And then the reclamation site is just all over the place. But just interesting that there's way, 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 way more ants in our reclamation site than we have in our forested site. And then our other reclamation site, again, reclamation site two, same thing is it has a lot of ants again, has a lot of spiders and it has a lot of beetles. Um, we have a little bit of the other ones. And again, it doesn't seem to have a very clear relationship between all these different groups. We're just seeing very, very random fluctuations. So very interesting. So what about the other extraction that we did? So that was the Tallgren funnel extraction. So we did the same thing. We took all of the individuals that we collected for each sample and started to put them together and see, all right, how do these change, you know, from May, June, July, blah, blah, blah. And these are interesting because the pitfall traps, there wasn't a very clear pattern. You know, there were some months where the forest site had a lot higher abundance. And then there were some months where the reclamation sites had higher abundance. But what's interesting with the Tallgren extraction, so those are all of the actual soil cores, um, there was a very clear pattern that the forest site always, always, always has a much higher overall abundance of the inverts that we extracted through the Tallgren extraction. So what did we find in the Tallgren extractions? How are these invertebrate groups different than what we would find in the pitfall traps? So again, pitfall traps, are these friends and they can walk. They can walk pretty far. If you think about beetles, um, ants, all of those, they have really good dispersal abilities. You know, some of these things are winged so they can fly. So they actually, you know, can move, they can enter and exit an area much more rapidly than everything that we extracted from the Tallgrens. So here's some of the stuff we found and this is where, oh, they're so cool. So these majority of what we found in our tall grain extractions were mites. So the first group that we found are the orobatid mites. Um, so they sometimes get referred to as beetle mites because they're just, they're heavily armored. They are little tanks. Um, so a majority of them are, they're heavily armored. They, um, they're the slower, because they are so heavily armored. Imagine if you had a tank on your back and you were trying to walk around. So it means that because of all of that extra protection that they're slower, uh, they produce fewer offspring um, and just their whole life cycle in general is just a lot slower compared to the other mites. Um, we also found prostigmatid mites, which you find here in the center. Um, they are horrible. I call them my tiny white friends because they are so small. Um, but prostigmatid mites are really interesting because a lot of them are very soft bodied, um, really small. So they are excellent, you know, food sources for some of the things that are more predatory. Um, but prostigmatid mites can also be predatory. So it has just a wide variety, um, but a lot of them very, very small, very difficult to identify. Um, other mites were astigmatid mites. Um, so a lot of those are actually, um, a fair amount can be parasitic. So it's a little bit hard to see, but at the posterior end here of this mite, they have little sucker plates that they can attach to. Um, so a lot of these mites will, um, can be found on beetles. And so these guys can actually maybe disperse further than some of the other ones. Cause if you can catch a ride with, you know, a faster beetle, you're able to disperse a lot more, but they're very interesting. Cause yeah, you can find, sometimes you'll get a sample and you'll find 40 of them. And then sometimes you get a sample and there's none. Um, so other ones that we have, another mite group would be the mesostigmatid mites. So these are very predatory. They have really extensive like mouth parts and chelicerae. So they love to eat the little tiny white friends. Um, and again, they are a bigger mite. They do have much more dispersal capabilities. They're much faster and quicker than the orobatid mites. 
And then the other ones that we found most commonly were columbolins. So columbolins are also known as springtails. They are hexapods, so they're not insects, but they do have six legs. Um, and what's cool with them and the reason they're called a springtail is if you look at this middle image right here, you can see this weird projection off the posterior end. And that is their furcula. And the furcula almost acts as like a, a springboard. So it will curl under and then it'll flick itself and it can jump. So they actually, um, the larger columbolins actually have a really good dispersal ability. But there's also, you know, little tiny white, you know, fleshy, excellent prey source columbolins um, that have the smaller dispersal capability. But what's fascinating, at least to me, is that on this slide, we have all of basically major parts of the food web represented. So that's another cool thing with invertebrates is just you're measuring them, but you now have various trophic levels because you have prey, you have predators, you have decomposers, you know, you have things, you have all of, you have producers, you have all of these living together. So just by measuring soil invertebrates, we're actually able to know a little bit about the food web or about the food system in these different ecosystems. So again, what are the major groups that are dominating? Because that's what we care about. We're trying to narrow down out of all of these invertebrate groups, which one should we care about the most? So in our forested site, again, the biggest groups that are dominate, that are dominating, sorry, I got confused. So we have our aura batted here in the teal. So they're quite high in our forested site. We have, so the orobatid again are the little armor mites, the little tanks. Um, we have really a fair amount of prostigmatids. So a lot of the ones that we found in our sites were the small, fleshy, you know, probably very tasty prey material. And then we also have our columbolins. So those are the three main groups that were the most abundant. And then lower down, you know, we have the other ones just not occurring as much. So in our reclamation sites, and again, if we're looking, sorry, the abundances in our forest much higher because we're looking at around, you know, an average of 40 individuals per month. And then if we go down to our reclamation sites, we can see the average number of individuals per month for these are roughly around 10, 15. So important to note. But again, the three major groups that we're seeing most often in the reclamation site were again, our columbolins and our orobatids, but very interesting that the prostigmatid, again, most of those being those prey mites, really decided to take off. And that's not something that we saw in the forest. Um, in the forest, you know, we never really see the prostigs getting up that high. And then again, in our second reclamation site, so if we're looking at the average, there, you know, the average number of individuals per month that we found, roughly about 20. So still very much lower when we compare it to our forest site. And we're seeing we have our columbolins, we have our prostigs, and again, they're doing a really big jump up right at the end um, with the prostigs. So again, really interesting just because they are such a prey material. And we're always looking for differences. What's happening in these reclamation sites that's not happening in the forest and vice versa. Oh my God, what does all of this mean? Well, that's a really good question. So all of this that we're looking at has shown us that there's, there's significant differences between our sites. There's differences in our soil, in our veg, but more importantly, there's big differences in our invert communities. So the next steps that we need to do now that we know that there's differences, now that we want to explore that, is now doing that indicator analysis. So let's take all the soil, all the veg, all the inverts, plug it into the computer, and figure out which one of them is the best, which one accounts for the variability the most. Um, and then from that, we can also determine what are some of our invertebrate groups of special interest. So when we were looking through those slides, you know, a lot of groups came up time and time again, right? We had the spiders, the beetles, and the ants. And then in our other group of invertebrates, we had our orobatid mites, our prostigmatid mites, and our columbolins. So already we went from a bunch of potential invert groups, we already shrunk it down a whole bunch. 
So we can figure out those special groups and then really focus in on them. So take those special interest groups and then get a deeper taxonomic identification so we can start to determine because there, you know, there are certain beetle species that love disturbance or that are you know, very sensitive or they're very generalist feeders or they are very restricted and have a very restricted diet. The more we know, uh, the more we can make assumptions about our different ecosystems. And then once that's completed and we've, you know, we figured out our special interest groups, we know that they're a good indicator, we've done the taxonomic identification, then what we have to do is start getting industry and government involved because it's great to do this work and, and figure out, you know, maybe we need to include invertebrates, but that's never going to help or change or do anything if we're not speaking with industry and if we're not inviting those people to the table so that we can make changes to these legislations. So the whole desire with this project is that we can come to government and say, listen, we looked at all the different invertebrate groups and these are some of the ones of interest. Um, here's a suggestion of how we could include this in monitoring and maybe we could start a pilot project to get that you know, up and rolling. So that is what our next steps are and what all of this means. So maybe you zoned out the entire time and you were not paying attention and you know your partner or your friend is gonna be like, oh, how was that talk you attended? And you're like, well, I wanna say something smart. So here's some take home messages. This is where you can take some notes. So what does this all mean? There is, I cannot stress it enough, a fascinating world that is unexplored. The number of invert species that we still don't know is astronomical. And it's an entire ecosystem literally just under our feet. There's an entire world of decomposers and producers and predators and prey all in a handful of soil. Um, so it's beautiful. Uh, it, I actually, yeah, I, you can't see, but I got goosebumps. <laughs> Um, what's another take home message? The research has already shown that invertebrates are a better indicator. We already know all of this. Um, I don't need to prove that, but what I need to show now with the research, um, specifically in Alberta, is that it will lead to more efficient reclamation, um, that if we incorporate them, it will help save money for industry. Again, if you think about, if you have an early detection system, it lets you know if there's a problem much sooner than everything else, that is going to work to our advantage because that means we can get on top of a problem before it turns into something a little bit more catastrophic. Um, so eventually it will end up just saving money because again, if, if we can catch a problem early, it's probably more likely we're gonna be able to mitigate it. And just not only that, it will help save money, because yes, that is important, but more than anything, it will give us a little bit more confidence when we say that these areas will be successful. So it, especially as a land reclamation scientist, it allows me to be more confident that now that this ecosystem has been reclaimed, it has the ability to handle whatever life throws at it. Um, and more than anything, what I would love people to remember is that human disturbance and our human footprint is just going to continue to grow. That is not going to change. Um, our need for oil, our need for resources is not going to change. So as a population, we will continue to harm this planet and reclamation is, is how we heal this planet. So more than anything, if this is how we heal the planet, we owe it not only to ourselves, but to the future generations to make sure that we're doing our job right, because really we don't have an alternative option. So that's where I'm gonna leave it. And I will take all of your questions as I you know, just shared an entire thesis. <laughs> yeah, in an hour. Uh Everyone else's camera's off, so I will wildly applaud. That was amazing. Uh, as a fellow land reclamation scientist, uh, land reclamation is the way we heal lands, how we can move forward. Uh, we do have a bunch of questions come in, uh, so I wanna make sure we have time. Uh, so the first one, 
was about pitfall trapping. Why did you choose one week as your trapping time? So a lot of, um, a lot of it will, you can really leave it for whatever amount you want. Um, but the only thing is the week is really the maximum you want to leave it. Um, with the kill fluid, it's just, it's not responsible to leave it that much longer. Um, the nice thing, I could leave it for seven days again, because this is a reclamation area. So it's a closed area. People aren't coming in. So seven weeks was, or seven weeks, sorry, seven days was just, it's pretty commonly used. We wanted to capture everything. Um, but if you're not using a kill fluid or if, if my sites or my traps were maybe like in the city, I would never leave it for a week. I would check those traps every single day. Okay. Uh, have there been any conclusive long-term studies, or sorry, have there been many conclusive long-term studies to look at the effectiveness of different matrices like flora and soil over the course of 30 plus years uh, in the reclamation field? Not in Canada. The only thing I think that would maybe get close to that would be the research that's coming out of Australia. So Australia really did, um, they had bauxite mining happening in one of their forests and with a lot of um, community pressure and people being involved, they decided that they wanted that forest to be restored, not just reclaimed. So they wanted it to be exactly what it was before. Um, so that company really took the ball and ran with it and they started measuring everything, birds, everything. Um, and they still found that invertebrates were better, but they're 30 plus years, I don't, I don't think so. It's uh, hard to put that much money into a project when it's not required at this point. Well, and that is a really good point, Valerie. Yes, that's probably one of the main reasons that that research doesn't exist. Uh, the research that's coming out of Australia really is an exception to the rule. Um, yeah, because the company is the one that was like, yeah, let's do it. And that's not pretty, that's not very common. Uh, the next question we had was rather than perform taxonomic analysis on mites and other soil fauna, why not use a proxy measurement like bulk soil respiration rate? Yeah, so there are different proxies that you can use. Um, there's stuff you can do with microbial things. Yeah, like how much is it respiring or like what is the whole biomass? Um, you could do that. You could, there is a bunch of invert metrics that you could use, but my idea was that I need to do the in-depth work. Um, so I need to do the fine detail to know at what point are we getting enough information? So again, these metrics get used because we say that they work. That's why we're using soil and veg metrics to represent an entire ecosystem's function. So we're making a lot of assumptions that those are appropriate metrics when they're not. And as you're saying, you're doing that in-depth measurement uh, so that you can take recommendations to government and to industry. How do you see use of invertebrates going forward with people that don't have those specialized skills. Like it would be great for every company to have someone who has those specialized invert skills, but it might not be possible. Is there still a way to use invertebrates? There is, um, I'm really hoping. So some of it, and again, it depends on the invertebrate group. Some of them are very easy to identify. Um, some of them have, um, genomic data available. So you have, you know, you can take a sample, homogenize it, like extract DNA, and then it can tell you all the different beetles or certain insects that were in your group. So there are different metrics that would be quicker. What's unfortunate is that because of a large, especially with mites, there's such a large proportion of these invertebrates that we don't know that have never been discovered. So we don't have like the, the library, the genetic reference for it. So there are, what I see happening, hopefully happening, is that as research continues, and I know that there's a lot of really cool people working on the genomics behind mites and getting, you know, a reference library for that, that is how I see things moving in the forward, that it would be, you know, you go to the site, you take your soil sample, it does a chemical analysis, and with it comes back, you know, the major microbe groups, major invert groups, uh, that's where I would love to see it go, but 
I do think it's going to be a little bit of time before that happens, especially with the mites, because there's far too people, far too few people that are working in acrology and, and ad, the taxonomic identification of mites. So I don't know if that will, ever, yeah, it'll happen, but that's where I see it going is those easier measurements. In the shorter term, uh, were you an invert identification specialist when you started this program or was it a skill you had to learn? Is it possible to learn the skill in a reasonable amount of time? I will tell you, it is possible to learn anything if you love it enough. Um, so I wouldn't say that I'm even an expert yet because I didn't know a bunch. Um, I had to go to the States to go into an immersive three-week program just to learn a little bit about mites. Um, I'm pretty sure there's, Carlos is here from that course. He was there with me in Ohio for, you know, 12 hour days for three weeks, a very intensive course. And with it, I brought unpublished taxonomic keys. It is difficult, but the cool thing about all of us weird like invert people, mite people, bug people is we're all really weird. And if you reach out and you're like, hey, I find this interesting, will you help me? We're probably going to say yes. <laughs> I think you might regret that decision. To no, I will not. All right, audience, you've heard. Uh, so you have started doing this at a, a coal mine kind of in a forested area. Can your results be directly taken to other ecosystems? Uh, or is that a future step? So that would be a future step. So what's difficult is like, I'm trying to answer a very big question that can't be answered. You have to answer like the smaller questions first. So you can't just take what I found, transplant it, you know, cause mine's out near Edmonton. I can't take that, put it in the oil sands in Northern Fort McMurray and expect to find the same thing. Um, there is going to have, there's differences, right? Especially geographically, climactically. But that being said, we have to start somewhere. So let's start with a place that's close. Let's get the research. And if I can show them that it applies here in coal mining and it provides, you know, saved money and all this other stuff, you know, better methods, that's the first step to then us expanding into other areas. And initially, when Anne and I had come up with this project, <laughs> we were going to do um, sampling at the coal mine, we were going to go to pipelines, and we were going to go to the oil sands. And then we realized how much work we were going to go to Divik, we were going to go all over the world. And then we realized, no. Uh, so we just stuck to the the area that we did. But yeah, future work would be then expanding into different ecosystems and different disturbances, because again, they have different effects on soil and all of that, so. To give the audience a sense of when you're saying a lot of work, how many uh, how many samples, uh, invertebrate samples, did you have to look at and probably still are looking at? Oh, well, we collected every month, like, 180 pitfall traps and 360 Talgren. So yeah. Every month? Every month, yeah, for six months, for two years. So um, let's cross our fingers, everyone collectively, that karma is not real because I have killed so many insects, <laughs> billions, billions. And yeah, um, it's okay. I try to do good things every day to get back in the creator's good graces. <laughs> there you go. Uh, one of the questions we got is, do you see climate change having an impact on the use of these indicators? If Alberta is becoming drier, how will that impact soil invertebrates and the use of them as bioindicators? Climate change is just, it's, it's, it's going to mess everything up. And that's why I think soil invertebrates are going to be so much more useful than what we're currently measuring. Because again, if things are drying up and things are not going to survive in that area, the sooner we know the better. And soil and veg just isn't going to tell us that. And that's why it does feel more urgent now than ever that we need to start being sure that what we're doing is working. Because right now, I, I don't think that we're collecting enough ecological data to conclusively say that this ecosystem can function at an equivalent capability. Because what we're measuring 
in our soil and our vegetation does not take into account how an ecosystem functions, right? Like how the nutrients cycle, like none of that, what we're measuring, none of that tells us anything about that, so. Absolutely. Uh, if anyone has any last questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. I'm happy to, uh, to pass them along. Uh, but we were talking earlier about invasive plant species. Uh, and one of the questions I got earlier was, how do invasive invertebrate species impact uh, these ecosystems and the use of these bioindicators? Things like pine beetles, Asian uh, giant hornets, all of these invasive invertebrates, how does that impact your work uh, and these ecosystems? Yeah, they're jerks, right? So a lot of them, um, and what we're seeing out at Genesee um, is we're trying to reclaim these forests we want them to turn into forests and we're finding like agricultural pests. So that's not great because those will know they'll affect our vegetation, our vegetation health will tank. Um, and what's also happening is a lot of these, a lot of these invasive species, they just, they're able to just overrun everything. So we're seeing when we were looking at the number of spiders in some of our earlier like graphs, all of those spiders are, um, the daddy long legs, like the harvestman spiders, like an invasive species. Um, so they do the exact same thing, the invertebrate groups do the exact same thing that plants do is they outcompete the native species. And then what can happen is because they're able to proliferate and be so successful, you lose your diversity because they can outcompete, you know, some of the other guys that aren't that well adapted. And then we end up with you know, maybe one or two species of beetle. And then what happens if we get a drought and that species of beetle is very susceptible? Well, there go all your beetles. So we need to have diversity um, and a wide range of inverts because then if a bunch of them die, there's other ones that can inevitably fill that void. Absolutely. We need that biodiversity to maintain our ecosystems long term. Yeah, it just makes sense that the more variability you have, the more likelihood that if something catastrophic happens, that at least somebody's going to live. <laughs> and keep those ecosystem functions going. going. Well, I think that is all the questions. We will stick around for a few minutes. Uh, if you have a question you didn't feel comfortable answering, uh, asking to the room, Stephanie, is there anything you'd like to say, last thoughts, uh, before, we, before we sign off? Insects are just, insects and invertebrates are, they're just so cool. And if anyone is like, oh yeah, that's interesting, uh, reach out to me. I would love to talk about it. Um, I am hoping eventually, uh, once COVID and stuff allows, to maybe start like a little amateur entomology club where we kind of maybe go into the river valley and collect some things and just share knowledge because yeah I don't know the diversity is just it's cuckoo bananas and if you ever were like oh I really want to discover a new species well you need to get into the field of invertebrates because that's where they're at and if you guys let me discover all of them I'm going to give them the dumbest names so don't let me because yeah it's going to happen. Well, thank you again. It's been an amazing night. Wild round of applause. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us as well tonight. We hope you learned something new. Uh, our next talk is April 28th on From Resistance to Acceptance of Wind Farms in Alberta with Professor John Parkins. Uh, it should be a very interesting discussion. We hope you can join. The link is in the chat as well as one of Professor Parkin's uh, articles uh, so you can learn a bit about what he's doing. And I'm gonna pass it off to Cassidy. Thank you, uh, Valerie, and thank you, Stephanie. That was fantastic. I was engaged the whole time. You couldn't see me, but I was laughing at all your jokes, so. <laughs> I appreciate them. Um, yeah, not much more to add. I think that ended on a great note. I will be sending one more e email this evening just with these links for next month's talk to some of Stephanie's research as well as the feedback survey for this evening's talk. So if you have any feedback or um, just want to let us know that you enjoyed it, that's always appreciated too. 
Um, and with that, I will say have a wonderful evening and uh, thank you all for spending about an hour and a half of it with us. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Stay healthy, stay safe. Bye.